Okay, so it's now my pleasure to introduce Jill Harvey. Uh, now, Jill uh, is a professorial research fellow from the University of Adelaide and has previously been Professor of Health Management at Manchester, UK, and importantly been also part of the NICE group who have done a lot of really good things in the UK about um, uh, various quality initiatives, and she has a strong interest in both quality improvement and knowledge transfer, and uh, she's escaping from the northern cold to Adelaide in the city of churches and going to talk to us now about translating evidence into practice. Thanks very much, Jill. Thank you, and uh, I probably should start with a disclaimer because I'm probably one of the only people in the room who isn't an expert in, in hand hygiene. So, so I'm really going to talk very generally around uh, my area of interest, which is how, why, um, and whether people use evidence in their decision making. So that's really where my research is, is how do you get research knowledge actually implemented in the real world amongst clinicians, amongst managers, amongst policy makers. And hopefully it'll pick up on, there's a, you know, quite a lot of the, the presentations so far, I think I'll pick up on some of the issues that have been discussed. So in, in terms of the session, um, I'm really going to just start off by, by clarifying some of the language that's used. It, it's a field that, like every other, has got its own, its own terms, its own uh, language that people use. But I really want to look at um, the meaning under, uh, that underpins the terms that people use. Uh, summarize what we know already from research into this area and then say a little bit specifically around the work that I've been involved in, in in sort of trying to map out what are the main influences that determine whether and how people use research evidence in their practice. So if anyone who sort of looked into this area, there's an endless stream of terms that people use, knowledge translation, uh, utilization, implementation science, there's a whole journal called implementation science, knowledge transfer, translational science, and that, that's probably the term I've seen most in Australia, knowledge translation and translational science. But I think looking be beneath the definitions that people use, to me there are, there are sort of very, very um, opposing views of how you make this happen in the real world. So I think that the traditional view is that it's, it's a pipeline. And you may have seen people talking about the translation pipeline. So this idea that there's, there's a linear, a straight line movement from, from research to actually changing practice and changing patient care. So the idea is that, that we start with research and we've got to find ways to make that research more accessible, more usable by the people whose practice we want to change, whether that's clinical staff or managers or policy makers. And so the idea is really that we're pushing research evidence out into the system. And, and we've seen lots of developments around that in terms of developing clinical guidelines. That's very much an area that I came from, undertaking systematic reviews. We know that there are barriers, you know, that stop that happening, so we think about what they may be, and, and we try and develop strategies to, people often talk about closing the gap, to, to actually overcome the barriers that exist. I suppose where I come from is I challenge that view that it is a pipeline. I don't think it, it works like that in, in practice. And, and some evidence of that, you know, we have been talking about that the, the difficulty of translating research evidence into practice, oh, probably at least for the last 15 to 20 years. So in, in the States, in the US, um, there was a really influential study at the end of the 1990s where they did a review of, of Medicare um, records and concluded that up to half of the care that, deliver, that was delivered in the US was not in line with the, the latest research evidence. Similar studies followed in Europe. But interestingly for me, um, 14 years later in Australia, the care track study that was done out of, of New South Wales tried to replicate the work that had been done in the States 
and concluded that in Australia, patients receive care judged to be appropriate in line with evidence-based guidelines 57% of the time. So, so one conclusion could be that we've actually not progressed very, very far in the last 15 years in terms of closing this so-called gap between evidence and practice. And, and if you look at the research that's been done in, in the field of knowledge translation, I think there are some really strong messages that come out of it. Uh, that it, it's not rational. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, Lindsay's presentation, we're not all the same. There is not a simple solution to this. Um, that it's very complex. There are multiple things to take into, ac into account. Uh, that context plays a really strong influence. So what happens in one place and works well, it won't work successfully in the next place. That might just be the next unit in, an organ in a hospital, or it might be the next state, or it might be the next um, country. But we know that context plays a really strong effect. And following on from that, you know, we can invest endless amounts of time and energy into providing the most rigorous and robust research evidence, but it's no guarantee that it will change practice. And I think picking up some of the things that people have said already, the, the research would suggest that you need interactive implementation strategies. So I think Jen's um, finding that that wasn't a common way of education is interesting. You need in interactive strategies, you need to tailor the strategies, you need to understand what you're trying to do and where you're trying to do it and come up with an approach that fits. So picking up that whole issue around what motivates people and, and personalities. And, and that if you have people in roles that actually actively support, so like the champions or people who help to facilitate the process, that there's evidence that that's a really beneficial thing to do. What, what you, I've seen as well is that, that there is a shift away from describing it as knowledge transfer or this more linear pipeline model to actually seeing it in a different way and, and, and getting away from the idea that research knowledge is sacrosanct, you know, that, that that's the pinnacle and actually that we need to work closely with, with practitioners and with policy makers throughout the whole process so that we define the right questions, we understand what questions need answering, and we work together to find the solutions and to implement them. Because if people have got some sense of ownership, they're much more likely to get on board and be involved. And so the emphasis becomes not on generating more and more research evidence, but actually answering que questions that matter from a health service point of view. And, and the terms that are often used to describe that would be more, they'd be more active. So in Canada, particularly where they've left, led a lot of this work, they talk about knowledge mobilization. And that's about bringing people together to, to create and use knowledge in practice. In terms of, of why I got interested in, in this whole field, uh, I trained as a nurse, but spent, um, 16 years in the UK working in, in quality improvement, in evidence-based practice, working for the National Institute for, for Clinical Excellence, and, and really got increasingly frustrated that everything that I read in the policy documents described these wonderful models that looked how, how things should translate into the real world, and it just wasn't like that. It was hard, it was messy, it was difficult, people wouldn't do what you asked them to do. And so uh, with colleagues at the time, I was working in Oxford, we d developed this framework called the Paris Framework. And uh, like anything, it's an acronym, but uh, it was meant to reflect how you get research implemented in health service. And, and basically, we said, it's not rational, it's not linear, we know that it's multidimensional, and we propose that to really get evidence implemented into practice, you have to understand the interplay between the evidence itself and how, it, how the research aligns with clinical experience, 
with patient experience and with the local experience. You have to understand the context into which you're trying to introduce it, so the culture, the leadership, whether they're used to doing things like this, and you have to think about the way in which you try and facilitate the process, what roles you've got, and what, what strategies you use to try and make it happen in practice. And, and since then, I've, I've been sort of testing that. We know intuitively people have connected with it because it helps to sort of explain their, their own experience of trying to introduce things. But, but we've been doing more work around trying to understand actually some of the things that people have talked about already. So thinking about what it is that you're trying to introduce. So, so the characteristics of the actual change that you're trying to introduce into practice, how it aligns with, with how things are done already, what type of evidence underpins it, how it, how it sits along people's experiential knowledge. Then about who you're trying to target, so particularly focusing on do they want to change, so motivational factors, and can they actually change? Do they have the knowledge and the skills to change? And doing that, I think it's really interesting listening to the, the personality because for some people that's a very individually focused activity, but for groups like nurses, it's very much a team-based collective activity. And then I'd say one of the really important factors is understanding where you're trying to introduce the change. So what is this, the organization or the setting like where you're trying to do this? Is it a place where people are very innovative, where the leadership encourages people to take risks, or is it very much a, um, a risk-averse, rule-bound, and that, that has a really strong influence? And then, you know, how, how do you do it to create ownership, to work with people where they're starting from? and build the relationships and the networks that you need to do that. And, and so we have adapted the, the, the framework a little bit to reflect that. And, and I think our over, overriding view is that you have to actively facilitate the process of implementation. And it's really hard to, to sort of uh, uh, present that graphically. So, so it's not a straight line. And this is probably the best alternative we've got at the moment to how that, how that might look if you were trying to illustrate it. So that you, you start with the thing that you're trying to implement. So in, in our case, it might be a hand hygiene initiative. And you understand um, what you're aiming for. You set very clear goals to motivate people. You use audit and feedback to reinforce that. But then you almost build the layers around it. So you need to think about the people. So, so those types of issues that we've just heard about around what clinical group it might be, what motivates them, what their current knowledge and skills is. But I would say you then need to embed that into these layers of context at a very local level, so what it's like to work there, what the culture's like, at an organizational level, what the prevailing leadership uh, style is, and at a health system level, what are the incentives, what are the barriers that may exist. And, and in our work, we, we focus very much on, on developing people to actively facilitate across those different levels. And, and think about the different skills and knowledge that people require to do that. So definitely project management, quality improvement skills, but as you start to move through the layers, skills in working with teams, in managing conflict, in negotiating and influencing and managing upwards as well. And, and the sort of work that we, are, we, we do is, is really try and build a network of facilitators. So not everyone <laughs> comes with a ready-made skill set, so developing and, and training people to start in the role, but, but supporting them with mentors who can, who can advise. Because I think as you, um, the further out in that, in that spiral you get, the more challenging the issues you come across. So if you're trying to introduce a change, 
that is so different to what the organisation is used to. You need someone who's got really quite advanced influencing and negotiating skills. Um, I, I won't talk about um, the project in great detail because I know it's nearly co coffee time, but just as, as an illustration around how, how this might look in practice, in, in the work that I've been doing in the UK, it, it's actually focused in primary care, a lot of it, but we have taken a, a problem which is around chronic kidney disease. We had a clinical guideline that was you know, 200 pages long, but we just took um, from a stakeholder meeting what was seen as the two things that would make the biggest difference, and they became the goals that everybody worked to. And we, we used very similar uh, strategies than that I've heard um, this morning in the hand hygiene. We trained facilitators, we supported them with uh, a wider clinical and academic team, used quality improvement methods, audit and feedback, but we tailored the strategies. So we did very detailed assessments of the local context, and then for each different place, we just tweaked the strategies to fit most with what we thought the challenges were. And um, over time, we've, we've definitely seen improvements compared to local comparator groups who, who weren't involved. And, and I'll flick through these because they're, they're probably not desperately important. But I think the messages that have come out for, from doing this type of work over, over the last 10 years or so are that you have to get the balance between the what you're trying to achieve and how you go about doing it. And you definitely need good project management. It's absolutely fundamental, but you need to, to layer that with other types of, of knowledge and skills as well. So, so that involves understanding the, the, the sort of clinical content, but also having good process expertise as well working really closely with leaders and creating leadership support. Never underestimate the, the influence of context, um, that it, you can have the best laid plans in the world, but if you ignore it, it can really railroad projects. And that, if you're going to train facilitators, you need to really think about the level of knowledge and expertise and support that they need. In our work, we use a combination of both internal and external facilitators. So some who work within the organizational setting, but some who are from outside, uh, but create peer support and mentoring for them. And, and as I said, are, are really trying to think about how you build networks of, of different levels of experience and, and are doing work in Adelaide around that at the moment. So I, I know it's coffee time, so uh, I'll stop there. But you know that's that's probably a whirlwind summary of what I think is is what we currently know around how you get evidence into practice. That it's it's not straightforward, but there are some common lessons that are coming through the research that people are doing. And um, you know, if if you are interested or if you struggle to get to sleep at night. Um, th th this is a, a sort of summary of probably some of the issues that I've talked about and, and that we're testing out in our, our research programs at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Jill. Uh, so we've got time just for one or two questions for either Jill or myself. Anyone? Any questions? Okay, must be coffee time after all. So uh, thank you all. So there'll be time obviously to ask at the coffee break. Uh, we are on a very tight schedule, so we need to be back here at 25 to, so in 15 minutes. Okay, coffee's out to the right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jill.